Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, you're in for a thrill. We're dealing with a very exciting set of issues around spinal cord injury and neurodegenerative illnesses, such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, and the real hope, the real scientific and medical hope for recovery. And options that were long thought to be impossible, but world-leading research has proved is possible. UTS is very excited to be working with our industry partners and um, Professor Reggie Edison from UCLA to start making this possible. I'm sure you're going to get excited during the evening, so if you've got your tweeting gear with you, uh, please notice the hashtags. Feel free to get out there and tweet what's going on. Uh, we strongly encourage it. UTS particularly excited because we have a long and proud history in the health field and making a difference. We're particularly interested in research that translates into reality that changes people's lives. And again, the work you're going to hear about tonight more than exemplifies that. So I'm going to hand over now to Professor Bryce Vissel, who is an expert in neurodegenerative diseases and spinal cord injury, and will head a centre we're forming for neuroscience and regenerative medicine here at the University in the Faculty of Science. Bryce led research in, for brain and spinal cord repair at the Garvin Institute for Medical Research before he joined UTS, and was also had a time at the Salk Institute in the USA. Bryce gained international recognition for his research, receiving a number of awards, including the prestigious Fulbright Award, a Liberman Award, and a BioFirst Award. He's an active thought leader engaged in public discourse and debate around health and research matters. My great pleasure to hand you over to Professor Bryce Vissel to start your journey. Bryce. Thanks, Peter. So it's a great, great pleasure to be here. And um, to talk a little bit about a few minutes at least, about what we're intending to do with this new neuroscience and regenerative medicine <coughs> initiative here at the University of Technology, Sydney. Before I introduce you to the man of the moment, Professor Reggie Edgerton, who we are enormously lucky to be having, to have formed a powerful uh, relationship in terms of the science that we're going to do together, science that has already, for the first time, the first time in human history. <clears throat> it's been recorded in the hieroglyphics that if you had a spinal cord injury, there was no going back. <clears throat> and since then, in the last few years, after you know, an overnight sensation after 50 years of work, um, Professor Edgerton has been able to, for the first time, bring about recovery in people who've got spinal cord injury. And Professor Edgerton will talk a little bit about his work and the aspirations we have at UTS to help take that work to the next stage where we will be part of, I believe, not only getting people some improvement after spinal cord injury, improvement already that is occurring that is beyond anything we'd ever imagined possible, but take it to the next stage by working with engineering and with science, mathematics, physics, in a way that only UTS might be capable of doing internationally because of our unique culture and our way of doing things. But first I think I'll talk a little bit about what we stand for in terms of trying to achieve in uh, neuroscience. We're on the cusp of a revolution. Edgerton is just one, one very important, one very big part of that revolution and representative of it. We're on the edge of a revolution in understanding that brain and spinal cord repair is possible, that diseases that we thought previously to be incurable, diseases that are debilitating, devastating, that bring down families, have massive problems and effects on economies. These diseases, for the first time, are now becoming tractable. So we're on the edge of a revolution. <clears throat> and UTS, being a young university, it's the number one young university in Australia and one of the leading young universities internationally, and because it's young and agile, 
and hungry to make a difference. And the difference that UTS wants to make as a leading university of technology is to be a university that isn't just about ideas, although ideas are the fundamental basis for any advances in anything we do. Ideas are the basis of hope. That's why what makes us human is hope. But what UTS is able to do is to bring together groups of people from different faculties under a new model to address big problems in a transdisciplinary approach. We can bring together in ways that may not be possible at many universities and certainly at many medical research institutes. In fact, it's impossible at many medical research institutes to bring engineering, which we need to do things that we need to do with spinal cord injury, to, to do things in Parkinson's disease, in Alzheimer's. We need engineering. I won't have time to explain how or why, but we do. We need engineering, we need mathematics. Mathematical modelling of brain function is critical. We need physics, we need the faculty of science because science is a foundation of what we do. We need health because we're going to have to engage with physicians, we're going to have to engage with nurses, we're going to have to engage with physiotherapists. We need these people to be deeply engaged in what we're trying to do if we're going to bring about changes. And we've got all that at UTS and we can bring it all together under a leadership that is hungry and keen to make a real difference in the world. So we're outcome focused. And so by being outcome focused, we say we want to get over there, so we're going to bring what we have together towards achieving that outcome. We're going to bring and harness new technologies, data, creative thinking to grow our knowledge, and we're going to make new treatments possible, and we're going to contribute to new thinking. And I can't emphasize enough how important new thinking is. I've just said it but again, I'll say it again. When you go to an international meeting and you meet with other scientists, you often find that as a way of thinking, as a way that people have got dogma in their minds because they've been taught certain things since they were at school. When I was first working at the Salk Institute in the United States, I was taught that the brain doesn't have a regenerative capacity, that what you're born with is what you've got, and after that it's all downhill. But I was there at the Salk Institute when they started to, for the first time, show that regeneration of the brain is possible. It was extraordinary. It was just, I came back to Australia in 2002 and I said to people, I'm working on regeneration of the brain. And people would say to me, but we know that that's not possible. So what is not possible is what we're interested in. We're interested in the impossible. We're interested in doing things that are unreasonable. And we want to be unreasonable in terms of our dreams. But we want to be completely grounded in good, solid, careful science. And that's, again, if you look at Reggie's 50-year career, 40 years of it before having this sudden discovery... 40 years of it was really beautiful, careful, solid, thoughtful science. And that's what we've got to be grounded in. So we've got to be grounded on the ground and reach for the stars, and that's what UTS stands for. Um, the things that we're going to be addressing are, the, are big problems. They're diseases that are causing massive impact on our society. There's an estimated 1 million people with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's by 2050. In 20 years' time, it's going to be 1% of the Australian GDP. That's just Australia. The international figures are phenomenal. They're really, really concerning. And of course, economists like to talk about numbers and, and statistics and, and, and data like that. But the reality is that's a million people affected by the disease and then their families and their families' friends and, and, and so on it goes. And the, the burden of, of these disorders, seeing a loved one going through these things and being told fundamentally there's nothing we can do right now. And it's unlikely that, you know, we, you shouldn't have too much hope is usually what you're told. And certainly if you talk to people who had spinal cord injury when they first come out of a coma, for many years they've been told, just get used to it, this is the story, this is going to be your life. We want to say that that's not the case, and we want to think differently about these diseases. We want to be able to go to conferences with new ways of thinking, and we want to challenge people to think differently, and we want to be part of that. In spinal cord injury, as you'll see tonight, we're very determined to make a very big difference there, and we are going to do it by working with the best in the world. We're going to work with our partner, Spinal Cure Australia, Spinal Cord Injuries Australia, the SKIN, which is the Spinal Cord Injury Network. We're going to work again across faculties. We're going to work with international leaders. We're going to do whatever it takes because we're outcome-focused. And ultimately, I'm very interested in psychological disorders. And whilst this all seems very, very big, there's an underlying theme which I'll come to. But as I said, the problem is that there are no approved treatments at the moment that reverse any neurological disorders. There's some things that help with symptoms. And certainly in Parkinson's disease, there's quite a few things that can mask the symptoms for some time. But the inevitable decline, and anyone who's seen it, it's, it's very, very tough. It's very, very difficult but there is enormous hope in that area. So we're committed. 
we're committed to lead advances in helping people who endure these conditions. And we're going to lead by thinking differently, to work differently. We're going to work differently by bringing together people. We're going to work across breaking typical boundaries by which science has traditionally been working up till now. It's very easy to be critical and say, oh, well, scientists, they all work in their laboratories and they work as you know, what we call investigator-led in their little boxes and they don't talk to each other. But I think we also have to say it's worked extremely well. We're doing really, really well in terms of the last 50 years. If you look at where we got to from when we had antibiotics first invented, which was just around 1939, to where we are when you walk into a pharmacy today, we've done really well. But for the next steps, it's not going to be working the way that we've worked previously. We're going to have to bring big teams together and we're going to have to address these problems. We're going to re focus on excellence. The word excellence is something that we will drive. We will make sure that we're doing excellent research. We're going to cross disciplines. We're going to partner with our friends and, and ally organisations to keep us honest. You know, they basically like, we, we want a cure. You, know, you can't muck around. We're really serious about this. But they will also help us and they will also enable us. They will make it possible because we're going to be responsible to them as they are responsible to us. And we're going to share what we learn and inspire others because we're a university and we teach. And we want our students to come in and be inspired by the way we do things, to be prepared for the future, to understand that the future is very uncertain. There's going to be lots and lots of changes. But if you've learned to think well, you've learned to think of like a good scientist or a good problem solver, and you're a creative thinker and you believe the impossible might be possible, I think you're going to be very, very well set up for the future. And I think taking that research mentality right through all of our teaching is something that is critical in UTS. And UTS is known to have made some very profound inroads in terms of its teaching. So the point is, science equals hope. And the, if I want to sort of unify, tell you the unifying theme that's going to bring the centre to the fore and that's going to make sure these very diverse areas can work together, what I'm very interested in and what Reg Edgerton is exploiting and what we'll learn about today is something called neuroplasticity. You might have seen a book called The Brain That Changes Itself, I think is what it's called. But the principle is that what we've learnt is, not un is that, again, 10 years ago we were told the brain is pretty much set the way it is and it's all downhill as you get older. What we've now understood, and again, these are just such radical ideas, but we now take them for granted. The public know about these ideas that were radical 10 years ago. What we now know is that the brain can change its structure and its function in response to experience. That's how we learn. It actually changes its structure as we learn. But also it changes its structure if you have a stroke. If a person has a stroke, the brain is able to... I don't know if anyone's seen some with a stroke, but in some cases you see quite a remarkable recovery. It's not, we believe at this stage, it's not because the brain has regenerated itself, although we would like to think that and we're interested in that. What is happening is that the brain is finding new pathways, new ways of doing things, relearning and changing its structure to be able to do things differently. And that plasticity, that's called plasticity. And it's exciting, we need to understand it, we need to harness it, we need to manipulate it, and we need to be able to do those things in order to bring about the changes in the diseases that we're interested in. That's going to be a unifying theme. It's how we can use engineering, mathematics. We need physics and mathematics to model plasticity, actually. Again, it's not something I can go into now, but mathematics and physics inform neuroscience in a very profound way. We need very solid, good science, and we're going to need, again, psychology. We're going to need nurses. We're going to need physiotherapists, and they're all going to have to be trained around these ideas of plasticity. So that's the unifying theme. Tonight, you're going to be hearing about spinal cord injury. It's devastating. It's devastating, as you've heard, seen, or you'll hear about tonight, to people who've got the injury. It's not just that you can't, a person can no longer walk. This is, people often feel, oh, it's so sad they can't walk anymore. But it's not that. It's that they've lost not only their dignity, but enormous control of almost every body function that's important. You know, and it's small gains that can make a huge difference for a spinal cord injury patient. Changes in bladder function, bowel function, sexual function, body temperature regulation, the stuff that if you're laying in bed at night and you get a little bit hot, you throw the blanket off or you're part of the blanket, you stick one leg outside. you just got this constant body regulation going on to make sure you've got a good word as homeostasis. You're keeping yourself very balanced. But if you've got a spinal cord injury, you cannot even tell sometimes if your temperature's off. You certainly can't get the blanket thrown off. You can't throw your leg outside the blanket because you're hot. It's a really, really difficult situation. And we've lost some good friends along the way who have actually have been dear friends of ours with spinal cord injury. And these are people that I remember and I feel extremely passionate about. It's one of the things that drives me in the spinal cord injury space is that I don't want to see that again. I do not want to see that again. It's about 15,000 people with spinal cord injury patients 
It's estimated if, got a, if a person has a cervical injury, it costs the community $14.5 million for the lifetime because that person still lives quite a long life, but they get hospitalised regularly and they have many, many issues that they have to deal with. Just a small bed sore because they can't move, they can't feel that, you know, when you're sitting in a chair, you're moving all the time. Spinal cord injury patients don't have that sense and they can't move, and so they end up with bed sores, they end up in hospital, they can get staphylococcus infections. It, it can be very, very devastating. So it can cost $14.5 million for one person. To give you an idea of the program we're trying to develop, we need about $15 million. Compared to that, to one person costing $14.5 million for a lifetime. So in the annual national cost, if you look at all the people with spinal cord injuries, about $2 billion. So those are the numbers. Globally, there's about 500,000, 250 to 500,000 cases a year, and it's, it's really a major problem. I won't have time to go into much more, but I just want to sort of leave you with the thoughts that UTS is planning to be and can be a world leader in spinal cord injury research. We're going to put together a team and we're going to take, we've got plans in place with S Spinal Cord Cure Australia and Spinal Cord Injuries Australia for a multifaceted program. Now we're going to start slow, we can't do everything overnight. And we don't promise anyone here we're going to do everything overnight, but we know where we want to go, we know what we want to do, and that is to build a systematically a very integrated, nice program that addresses the problem in many ways. Neuromodulation, you'll hear about tonight from Reg Edgerton. We're interested in cell-based therapies. I think there's real hope in cell-based therapies. Again, we want to work with world leaders, with the people here, with government, we want to work with the community, we want to work with the hospitals, we want to get it into patients. We're interested in immunomodulation or inflammation because we believe that can help with acute injury. It may even be able to help with chronic injury. Interested in exercise physiology with our partner, Spinal, Cure, Spinal Cord Injuries Australia. And we're interested in any form of technology that can help. And that's, again, working with engineering. We're talking about bioengineering where we can create scaffolds, put cells in, maybe create a bridge across the spinal cord injury. <clears throat> but certainly exoskeletons is another idea where you can drive movement in people. And we think, ultimately, some people are going to need some of the one and some of the other, but maybe we're going to find an integrated approach. And UTS being UTS, aggressive, determined, focused, and able to draw together people with a model that says work together and we'll reward working together, which is a change in the way that rewards are going to need to be done in science. By doing that, we should be able to bring about these changes in, in spinal cord injury. So I'll leave it there. It's just to give you a big overview of the big plans but we're going to do it systematically, we're going to do it slowly, we're not going to be able to achieve it overnight, but we are going to do it. And we're only going to be able to do it if we've got the community engagement, and we're only going to be able to do it with the university engagement. And the, we've got a wonderful new dean, very excited to have that, Judith Smith, and with her, with the vice, vice chancellor, the provost, all the people here tonight, I hope that we will be able to form a wonderful team to make some of these things possible. So, um, Professor Edgerton, I rolled up in his office in California because I had some friends with spinal cord injury. <clears throat> and I read his most recent paper, which was published in The Lancet, where one person, he had gotten one person for the first time in history to show recovery from a chronic spinal cord injury. It was extraordinary. And a lot of sceptics, a lot of people didn't believe it. But I liked the data and I thought it was solid and it wasn't overstated. You read papers and things that are overstated. It was very modestly written. It was very well written. And subsequently, there was another four patients published by Reggie where he developed this showing that you can bring about these recoveries that were previously thought impossible to achieve. So my friends with spinal cord injury, I said, you know what, we need to work with this guy. We need to go over and have a chat with him and see if we can get him involved in what we're doing. And in fact, maybe we can send a few of my friends over there and get some treatment from Reggie. Well, that turned out to be a bit difficult because with a wheelchair, it's very hard to get in a plane. So if you can't get the spinal cord injury community to Reggie, what do you do? You bring Reggie to the spinal cord injury community in Australia. And that was the goal and that was a dream. We're going to say UTS is going to make a difference. We're going to try and take what Reggie has done and just first replicate it. It's so new. He's been doing it, it published about 20 people so far. I think Reggie may correct that. It's brand new. This is the front end of a major wave. It's going to take off around the world. But he's willing to work with UTS now and here and now to try and make it happen in Australia here and now because of the approach and the willingness we have to make this happen. And we've got 20 people and published. He's got about 50 patients all up. So it's starting to look pretty robust. In UTS, we're going to try and replicate that because in science, you've got to take something that's done in another country, in another place, it's only been done one place. You've got to make it replicated somewhere else to show it's robust, that it's real. But also for us, we want to make sure that we replicate it exactly as Reggie tells us to do it, and that's what we'll do. But once we've replicated it, we're going to work with our engineering department, with our science, 
with our mathematics, our physics and all the other departments we've talked about and with inter other international leaders to take it to the next level. He calls it the Model T Ford of neuromodulation technology. I always say he's a lousy car salesman because you can, you know, who wants to buy a Model T Ford? So, but what we want to do is, I say, we want to turn that into a Maserati. And that's what we're going to be doing over at UTS over the next five to ten years. But for the next five years, we're hoping to have a very lovely, close, warm interaction with Reggie. We've, I believe we've become good friends and totally respecting each other and respecting Reggie and his incredible achievements. So I'd like to welcome Reggie to the stage to talk about his work. Well, thank you, Bryce. Uh, and I have to say quickly that the reason uh, we're here tonight is because of uh, his persistence in uh, coming to my office in Los Angeles. And the first time I uh, talked to him, I said this was interested. I've had similar conversations with other people, but uh, Bryce kept showing up more. And so uh, so we, we've come here, come a long ways. Uh, Okay, what I want to do today is, is to try to tell you as accurately and plainly as possible what we've observed. Uh, and I've always thought that with respect to the idea of hope, uh, that we, uh, it's really not a big issue with me. Uh, I just want to tell everybody what we observe. And, uh, and then you decide whether you want to have hope or not. And you need to know exactly where, where we are. And then I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about conceptually what, how we think it works. Because it is so unusual, there's a lot of skepticism about, well, it's just magic. It's not magic. Uh, it's a matter of us learning more about the physiology and how it really works. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the challenges. Now, the, the results that I'm going to show you, I'm just going to show you examples of things just to give you an idea. And so we're not going to be able to go into much depth, uh, but you, you'll get a perspective of where we are and what we've exposed that what might be possible. And so that's what's ahead of us is to determine what's possible uh, let's let's uh, examine it and see how far we can go with this idea. Okay, so uh, the next. Uh, so you uh, already talked a little bit about. I'm just going to skip over this really quickly. Uh, uh, every spinal cord injury is extremely uh, important to to that individual, and there's a lot of people that are affected. The main thing, as has already been stressed, is that uh, this. Uh, injury lasts for a long time, forever, and with respect to some uh, aspects of it. And then some of the multiple uh, functions that are affected, we've already discussed this, so there's no need to uh, reiterate here. So um, now here are uh, just a list of some of the things that we have observed in one or more of the uh, experiments that we've done. Uh, neuromodulation is becoming a very popular concept, and, but it means different things to different people. That usually is the case when, neuro, when, I, when a term means a lot of things to a lot of different people. But neuromodulation, it, one of the things I want to make sure that you understand is what we're doing is changing the properties of the neural circuitry within the spinal cord. And the easiest way to think about it is we're changing the mood of the spinal cord. You know what a mood is. You, your mood, you may be hungry, you, you may have just finished eating and whether the food is gonna taste great or not, it depends on the physiological state of your nervous system. And so uh, we, can, we think we can modulate the circuitry so that we can make it want to walk, um, to stand and to do other motor tasks. That's the general idea of neuromodulation. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Now we have different ways of modulating. And uh, uh, we, we have, for example, you see these e EMC, 
EMC to us means we're enabling motor control. We're not inducing movement. This is another hard thing for most people to understand. When you're stimulating, you expect stimulation and response. We will stimulate the subject and nothing will happen except what you don't see. We've changed the mood. We've changed the physiological properties of that circuitry so that it can do things that it can't without stimulation. We can do that with electrical stimulation. We can do uh, with an implant. We can do it with a transcutaneous, uh, what we call painless cutaneous uh, enabling. And uh, we have sensory and then we have pharmacological. There's different ways to do this. And so we're ex exploring all of those. And the basis for all of these has been, been uh, defined to a large extent in a large number of animal experiments, not only in our laboratories, but in a number of laboratories over a period of, of decades. And as a result, we've seen all these different uh, of functions that have changed as a result of this neuromodulation. Okay, so let's uh, go on. Now, what are the principles underlying this? Now, one of the, the other things is humans are really impressed with their cortex. We think everything we do is based on conscious control. But in fact, almost everything you do, all the movements that you make are relatively automatic. And it's based on just your processing that sensory information and you automatically do things. I mean, you can drive the work and you'll get the work and you don't even know how you got there with all the stoplights and everything because your sensory system is telling you what to do. Your sensory system has learned that. You don't have to consciously think about it. And so, uh, so that you, with neuromodulation, uh, you can get involuntary movement. That is, you can stimulate so you can actually induce these movements. But we try to avoid that. Uh, but you can uh, get the involuntary movement. And another uh, point that we learned very quickly, everyone knows that the sensory systems are important. All the sensory systems are important. But we didn't really realize how important the sensory system uh, was until we did a series of experiments and I'll show you a couple of reasons why we became so impressed with the sensory system. Uh, so, and then the other thing that we learned that is really important is that the spinal circuitry learns. That was not even considered a possibility uh, 20 years ago, but that was one of the first things we learned when we started on this journey that if you, you trained a, a, a spinal animal to step, they learned to step. If you trained a spinal animal to stand, they learned to stand. They learn what you teach it. And so without learning in the spinal cord, then the re rehabilitation is meaningless because when you go to one treatment and then the next treatment you do a little better, that's because what happened in the first one is carrying over to the next one, and it's really a process of learning. And what we found out is the biochemical process of this learning in the spinal cord shares many of the same characteristics as learning uh, in the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain which gets most of the attention. Uh, but then one of the things that we, lear we learn later is by modulating the spinal cord, you actually can make connect the brain can make connections to the spinal cord if you amplify the signals in the spinal cord so we'll talk a little bit more about that okay so the uh, we're going to talk primarily about epidural stimulation and transcutaneous spinal stimulation now just to make so you understand and don't get because uh, i'm going to show you interchange interchangeably experiments that, that involve both the epidural stimulation is where there's a surgically implant of electrodes on top of the spinal cord, on top of the dura, what's referred to the dura, a membrane that covers the whole brain and spinal cord. So you put electrodes on the top and then you can stimulate. This is a technology that's been around for decades, primarily used for spinal cord injury for pain and spasticity. But we thought that after all the animal experiments that had been done, it's, tr it's time to do this in humans. And so the, all the experts that we, we gathered in a meeting to, to ask the question, is it time to do this in humans? And there was unanimous opinion. We've learned enough. We should try it. But the only way we could try it is to use the technology that was available at the time. 
and that technology is for pain and spasticity. But we thought that it would be good enough to test the proof of principle. And it turns out it was good enough. And in fact, it was a little better than what we anticipated. But at the same time, it didn't take long for us to realize the shortcomings of it. And therefore, we're making a big effort to try to develop the new technology, a smart, smarter technology that can take advantage of the physiology that's, that's there. Uh, so, but the transcutaneous stimulation, we're finding that it has very similar effects, in some cases better uh, than with the epidural stimulation. The advantage, there are many advantages of the transcutaneous stimulation. We can place electrodes anywhere along the spine we want to get different effects. It's cheaper, it's going to be one-tenth the cost. It's going to be more applicable in, in simpler environments. So there's, there's a lot of advantages, I won't go further. The point is we need both. Now, just to give you an idea, what are we stimulating and a little bit of anatomy you're gonna learn here, whether you like it or not. And then, so we see the vertebrae, T9, T10, these, this idea most of you are be familiar with. Now, the, the, uh, the segments, the spinal segments are a little bit different than the, the uh, vertebral segments. But that area that's in orange up there, those are the segments that's largely responsible for controlling the lower limbs, the movement of the lower limbs, also the bladder, the bowel, sexual function. Many functions are located in that section. So our, our epidural stimulator covered most of that area in the, in the orange. So we're stimulating uh, most of those areas, even though we can stimulate local areas. And then uh, the electrode array, you see these numbers in the middle. Uh, that's the number of electrodes in the, in the array. And we can select different combinations of those to stimulate. So, uh, and then over here on the right tells you which muscles, if you activate the, that area, you'll get activation of these, these muscles. So that's the general idea of the modulation through stimulation. Now, here is uh, one of the first things. We did a lot of, we've done a lot of studies with individuals that are not injured. We tested these, these things. And we found out just electromagnetic stimulation. Some of you have probably seen or been exposed to this. You take this uh, a coil, you just place over the lumbosacral, the same region I just talked about, and just stimulate it five hertz. And, and uh, you'll see what happens. Uh, this, is a, this is an uninjured individual. We tell them to relax, not to step. And what the stimulation is doing is activating that circuitry that's built into the lumbosacral spinal cord that, uh, that uh, makes the uh, person start to step. And, uh, and uh, some of them, they don't do that. And, but if we give them a mathematic problem to try to concentrate on, uh, then they usually will step even though they're not trying to step. So that's an intrinsic, that's the automoticity that's built. And that's the automoticity that we're trying to take advantage of in recovering function because the spinal cord obviously knows how to walk, okay? And if you give it the sensory information, and here it doesn't even have the appropriate sensory information, there's no load-bearing sensory information here, but it still will do that. Uh, now, the other thing I mentioned, learning. Now, just to give you an idea, this is the trajectory of the pole of a spinal rat. Each one represents a single animal, and these are animals that can step, but step very poorly. And you can see uh, that they step poorly because of the variation. But you train them, and this is what the trajectory is if you train them. It's like uh, an athlete learning a skill you become more precise. The spinal, there's the only, this control is coming only from the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is learning the task that we teach it. Now, this is uh, going to show you, I'm going to show you now uh, the, uh, how important sensory information is. The, the, this is a rat that just uh, a couple of weeks earlier had been, his spinal cord had been completely cut at the thoracic level. And we've given it a pharmacological facilitator, so serotonin, you may have heard of it. And then uh, we, we have the treadmill moving in a forward direction. We reverse the treadmill, 
and it's going backward. And then we turn the animal to the side to see if they can walk forward. Can they walk backward? Can they walk sideways? And so when we do that, uh, start the uh, video. Uh, this is stepping forward. And then you uh, reverse the treadmill belt and you see them stepping backwards. And then you start to turn them in another, in, in one direction or another, and they're stepping sideways. How does the spinal cord know how to do this? The only way it knows what to do is by the sensory information coming from the muscles, the tendons, the skin, is telling the spinal cord exactly what it should do from in, in real time, real time information. So the sensory information is not there just to correct you when you make a mistake. It's, it's a fundamental part of all of your movements. And this emphasizes just how important it is. Now, uh, here is a good example of uh, also how important the spinal circuitry is in movement. This is an in, you're going to see in video. It, it lasts actually too long, but I think you need to see it. The idea here is that this individual has lost the ability to interpret proprioceptive information. There's a special type of neurons, which we don't even know who they are, but we know there are neurons in the spinal cord that their function is to match up what the brain needs to know and relative to the proprioception. Okay, so the idea is pretty obvious to you. Uh, if you, uh, how many of you have tried to uh, program uh, where are you going to go uh, with GPS? Now, you can't do it unless you know where you are. Now, the problem, with, if you don't have proprioception, your brain doesn't know where you are. It doesn't know where to start. And you're almost paralyzed. And you will see this individual, the trauma that this individual has gone through by losing proprioception. It can't, its GPS system doesn't work because every time the brain tries to figure out where to move, it says, where do I start from? And so that information is fundamental in the spinal cord and again emphasizes how important it is. Okay, so a long video, but I want to emphasize how important the circuitry in the spinal cord is in controlling movement. All the descending systems are still okay. It can talk to the spinal cord, but it doesn't know what to tell it. Now, where does the, how does the person learn? The person learns, relies totally on visual information. And so they have to constantly see where their limbs are, and then the brain can kind of figure it out. Now, the other point that's important in spinal cord injury is the spinal, this spinal circuitry is, is for the most part quite functional below the lesion. So it has this built-in automoticity. So the, you can walk forward, backward, sideways, and so forth just by having the proprioceptive information. But without proprioception, uh, you're virtually paralyzed. Now, with the first four subjects with epidural stimulation, they all learned to stand. They were motor complete. Some had sensory information. And they had these secondary results as well, primary results of independent standing, voluntary control, and some assisted stepping on the treadmill with, with some assistance in weight bearing. Bladder, bowel, sexual function, cardiovascular function, sensation, these things started coming about, which we were, were surprised about. And this was a work. Now, this first uh, four subjects that we did, this was a collaboration, a large team between UCLA, Caltech, and University of Louisville. So we had a, comp, a large team with different uh, expertise. And this shows. Uh, an individual that has regained voluntary control, moving one leg, pulling on a cable. And what you're going to see, all of a sudden his legs start to move much more because he broke the cable. And the, we're asking him to move, oscillate his legs. This is not just a small toe movement. This individual had been completely paralyzed for more than a year. Now somehow with the stimulation, 
with the stimulation, the person was able to make connections from the brain to the spinal cord. And this shows the oscillations and the EMG activity. They learned to stand. So uh, this shows an individual standing and, uh, try, and also trying to learn better equilibrium. He's got some support there with a stand, but you see that he has some functional capability, can throw and, uh, and, and catch a ball. So this is a very significant uh, improvement in function. Without the stimulation, this person can't stand. Okay, you have to have the stimulation. Now, how does this occur? Now, we don't know, uh, but we think it's something like this. If you have, to, you have to get enough excitation to reach a threshold to get movement if you're uninjured. But if you're injured, you may be able to get some excitation, but it's not enough to get you above the threshold when you can't move. But with, with some neuromodulation, you can get above that and, and start to move. So that's a simplified story. This is uh, some direct evidence. We ask the person to move. You stimulate with seven volts, the person can move. You stimulate with more volts, the eight volts, it can generate even more force. And then up to nine, then it starts to level off and you don't improve anymore. So the level of excitation is related to how much, uh, how, how much you can activate the motor neurons that causes the force. Now the transcutaneous stimulation, one of the processes that we've used is to stick the legs out over the table without weight bearing uh, with this special waveform. And the important point here is after 18, once a week for 18 weeks, we treated for about less than an hour, they received this transcutaneous stimulation. And at the end, you see uh, the amount of movement that's occurring with just voluntary in the green, and that that's occurring with voluntary plus stimulation is really not significantly different. That means after 18 treatments, the individuals were able to move their legs in an oscillatory pattern as much as they were with stimulation. And with stimulation alone, it was even less. So, uh, this was our first evidence that we could get uh, voluntary function back with the uh, transcutaneous stimulation. And then uh, we've, uh, this is stand, independent standing, and I won't go into the details here, but it's not just locking your knees and standing, it's dynamic standing is what we're trying to teach. And again, you get the activation of the muscles with the stimulation, without the stimulation you get nothing. And now the, the next project with transcutaneous stimulation, we combined it with the exoskeleton. And this was also exciting information. We think this is really something that we need to be focusing on. And by, uh, by the combination of, of the two, uh, within five sessions, we were able to uh, regain voluntary control in an individual who had been paralyzed for several years. And this particular individual is totally blind as well as uh, 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 totally paralyzed. And so this is what he looks like walking in the, uh, uh, walking in the uh, exoskeleton. And, uh, and, uh, and this is uh, over on the left there in the striped shirt, that's Yuri Gerasimiko, who's really the transcutaneous stimulation. He's one of the, 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 the chief one that really has come up with this idea and, and uh, has had the vast experience doing this. Next, I'll show the next one. And now this is, again, this person had not moved his legs uh, since he had become paralyzed. Now in this situation, uh, uh, Yuri is asking him to move, to flex his left leg and, uh, and without the stimulation on and he couldn't do it. He just turned the stimulator on and then this is the first time that he saw that he was able to move his leg. So stimulation on doesn't move his leg. He has to voluntarily try to move his leg and when, it, when he tries to move the leg and the stimulation on, he gets this movement. How far can this go? We don't know. How much we can take advantage of, but it's just the beginning. And at least I have to say that it's encouraging. Uh, and, and this is just showing the, the, the data. 
We've also now tried to do this with the upper limb. Can you neuromodulate the cervical spinal cord and get improvement in hand function? We've implanted three subjects. This is in collaboration with Dan Liu, a neurosurgeon at, at UCLA. And uh, this is uh, to the left, you see on the two subjects, uh, this is without any stimulation. You see their level of performance in hand grip. But then we start to stimulate and you see immediately in the same session with and without stimulation, you see there's an acute effect. But not only is there an acute effect in one session, but the person gets better and better. And so we're continuing these experiments to see how much we can get function out of the forelimb, not only with hand grip uh, and force, but also the movement, how accurately they can move and uh, how much shoulder movement, trunk control, those things are coming uh, along with the stimulation as well as movements in, in temperature control. And anyway, I'm not gonna go into the detail here because uh, I'm already way behind, uh, but uh, this is basically shown with transcutaneous stimulation as well as with the epidural stimulation. You have, this is an example of one subject over here on the left in the beginning, and then after stimulation and stimulation and training and drugs. Uh, uh, so all of those, uh, it looks like we can, <clears throat> the key is it looks like we can neuromodulate the cervical spinal cord, just like we can the uh, lumbosacral spinal cord. And uh, so I'm just gonna skip these hand, uh, hand uh, okay, show this video. I know all of you will be excited watching a uh, spinal rat P. Okay, this is what's happening here. The question is, can we learn to neuromodulate and control bladder function? And we think we can. If you, with a certain stimulation pattern, you see the stimulation is turned on, we filled up the bladder. Within 90 seconds, the bladder is 90% emptied. So uh, we, we think that the autonomic function, we're gonna be able to make a lot of progress on that. Now, the other th way thing we're interested in is stroke. And we uh, have t tested three subjects. I'll show you one subject, the legs extended over the table. We asked the subject with one leg is affected. One leg is inflicted after the stroke. We asked them to move in a rhythmic fashion without the stimulation. And then we asked them to do that with the stimulation on. And this is the first session. And so show this. So you can see that he's trying to move both legs, but you see one leg is moving, and then you see the next leg, uh, when you stim put the stimulation on, this is what he does. So that's, you have to say, or I would say, that's pretty encouraging. It's not conclusive evidence that it's gonna be a great clinical tool, but it's a good place to start, and it tells us that we should be uh, following this uh, so off stimulation and on stimulation, that's what you just saw. Cerebral palsy, we just uh, submitted a paper with the children uh, and we have some evidence that with cerebral palsy, we can improve their ability to, to step. And uh, again, not going in, in detail. So what have we seen? The primary outcomes, voluntary control of the lower uh, and upper limbs, improved trunk control, improved grip strength, grip control, independent dynamic standing, rhythmic stepping at zero G, increased leg strength and range of motion. These secondary changes, which none of us could say that they really should be considered secondary, but they were not what we expected in the beginning. And all of those deserve lots of attention. And so uh, the people that have uh, supported this, uh, these are some of the, the organizations that have supported the work and uh, the bottom line is we've seen some encouraging things and none of them do we know how far we're gonna be able to take it. We do not know what the properties are of a given subject will be. Can this subject, can we expect this subject to go this far and this subject to go this far? That's the type of information that we want. So after an injury, we want to be able to talk to the subject and the physician and say, okay, this is a situation, and based on what we know, if you invest this much effort, uh, this is a possibility that you will get this far. And I say invest because you don't get this for nothing. 
you have to train. You have to, you, you have to um, uh, uh, try to, you've got to enable the circuitry. The stimulation just enables you to do something. But if you just stimulate it and then you do nothing, you get virtually no gain. All right? You've got to tell the circuitry how to reorganize and become more functional. If you just stimulate it, it makes it more plastic, but it doesn't know what to do with the plasticity. So you've got to tell it what to do. That's our, our general idea. And the people that have been so important, that Roland Roy has been with me for, uh, from the beginning of this journey. Yuri Gerasimiko, I, I just told you he's been uh, in my lab from, he's uh, got his own lab in St. Petersburg and uh, is uh, now, I've uh, been with, with uh, our team for about 12 years. Parag Gad has done some fabulous experiments uh, in, in now studying the bladder a lot, as well as the locomotion. Joel Burdick from Caltech, uh, who is an amazing engineer, that anything uh, that we really have a, a challenge in technically, uh, somehow he figures out how to do it. Uh, Ruslan Gorodnichev, uh, for, again, a Russian colleague where we've studied a lot of the normal subjects. And then Wintai Lu is one of the first uh, engineers to build the retinal implant. He's building the implants for the new generation implant for epidural stimulation. And then uh, we have other, um, Amanda Turner, uh, who tells all of us what to do in the lab, and uh, uh, Dimitra uh, Sayinko. Uh, and uh, Giuliana Tacola, a visitor from, uh, from Italy, uh, and our other scientists in the lab, all of them are, are, are critical. And our, uh, our um, uh, University of Louisville colleagues, uh, Dr. Harkema and uh, Dr. Angela, uh, of course, have, were key uh, in driving the experiments in the first four subjects. And then a graduate student, uh, Neil Rath, who is uh, working on uh, trunk control, trying to figure out how far we can take transcutaneous and trunk control uh, in paralyzed individuals. So we'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reggie, um, for sharing with us uh, some truly astounding research that's going on uh, right now. As, as Bryce said, it's been going on for a long time, uh, and it will continue uh, in the States as well as here at UTS. Uh, my name is Tim Dean. I'm the science and technology editor uh, for The Conversation, and I've got to say it is being exposed to research like this that uh, makes me truly love my job and also uh, makes me optimistic about the future uh, and, and treating so many conditions that uh, in the past we considered to be uh, incurable or untreatable. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to invite uh, Reggie and Bryce uh, back to the stage and we're going to have a discussion uh, about their research. Um, and I'm also going to be uh, inviting a couple of other guests to the stage. But I just want to make a point that, uh, as Bryce said before, spinal injury doesn't just affect the individual. It affects their friends, it affects their family and their loved ones, it affects the community, and it has a dramatic impact on our healthcare services as well. When you see those numbers and the figures in terms of the number of people who are affected and the cost, we can see the pressing need to make great progress in this area, not only for the healthcare issues, not only for the, uh, the agency and the autonomy of the individuals, but the effect that they have on their loved ones and the community um, as well. And we're going to hear a little bit more about that uh, during the you know, panel discussion. Um, so at this point, I'd like to invite back to the stage uh, Reggie and to Bryce, and I'd like to introduce to you uh, our two other panelists. Um, we have, first of all, if you would like to make your way up to the stage, uh, Duncan and Kerry Ann. Um, we have Duncan Wallace, and Duncan is the CEO of Spinal Care Australia. This is an organisation with the single aim of promoting uh, and funding medical research uh, to find a cure for spinal cord injury. If you guys want to take a seat. Um, Duncan's early career was spent in Papua New Guinea 
where he ran uh, large coffee plantations. Uh, now, a road accident in PNG in 1984 resulted in him being flown to the Royal North Shore Hospital uh, to the spinal unit, unit as a C45 quadriplegic. Hi, Duncan, welcome up. Uh, since then, he's owned and managed a successful digital media agency, uh, progressing from print to multimedia and the internet. Uh, Duncan joined Spinal Cure as the CEO in July 2011, and he was elected to the board in March of 2016. Welcome. Uh, and I'd like to introduce our last guest. Uh, guest, she uh, barely needs an introduction. Uh, welcome up to the stage. Would you like to come on up? This is Kerry Ann Kennelly. Uh, she's an enduring and iconic Australian media personality whose life was changed forever in March of this year when her husband of 32 years, John, uh, fell from a balcony suffering a serious spinal cord injury. Hi, Carrie Ann. Uh, Carrie Ann joins us tonight to share uh, her and John's personal story uh, and struggle of adjustment with spinal cord injury and the renewed sense of hope uh, that she and John share as a result of Professor Edgerton's work. Uh, so please welcome all of the panellists to the stage. Now, we'll also we'll be giving you an opportunity to ask questions uh, throughout the night as well. We'll have a roving mic uh, going around. If you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. We've got two roving mics. Please raise your hand and we'll make sure to uh, get to you uh, in between questions uh, with the panellists. But look... To start off, I'd like to start with you, Kerry ann and I'd like you to tell us a little bit about uh, your story and your and John's uh, experience. Hi, everyone. Uh, can I just say how riveted <clears throat> I was listening to the professor? It's just wonderful and very exciting, and that hope that everybody with any injury let alone a spinal cord injury needs. That hope is, it may not be an official miracle, but for anybody involved in this area, it is a miracle. And thank you and, and all the other people you work with. It is exceptional and it's very, very exciting. Um, uh, it, what was it, six months ago and eight days, John took a step, just happened to be the wrong way, was off a veranda, through a hedge, was less than a metre, <coughs> fell the wrong way, he's an incomplete <coughs> quadriplegic. Um, now, six months and eight days into this, uh, you know, we're still trying to come to terms uh, with our new norm. Um, I don't like it at all, he likes it even less. But it is <coughs> something that we have to deal with, where novices, in this area. Uh, we've had to learn together how to cope and it's only day by day by day. Um, there is, my husband's such a, a, a vibrant guy and for anybody it's horrible, but for me on just my personal level, I can only deal with me, my feelings and how I see my husband. And at the moment, he's still in, Royal, uh, in, in um, Prince of Wales, started off in Royal North Shore. And he's working pretty hard in rehab, but he can't uh, feed himself. He can't scratch his nose. He can't uh, do any of the normal functions in life. Uh, for him, it's devastating. And I remember it very early days. It was probably just a a week or so into the injury when he was still in intensive care. He couldn't speak, he had a, uh, a, a, a uh, he was in, in incubated, uh, intubated, and so he couldn't even mouth. So we got, we started blinking. Uh, no lip reading because he had this horrible thing all the way down. So blinking, we've got, you know, a bit vowels and I had a little whiteboard Apparently I wasn't very good at, and he'd get really filthy with me because I wasn't very, I wasn't sharp enough. So I remember the first time he spelled something out for me, and it was paraplegic. 
it was gutting because I didn't have the heart to tell him he wasn't that lucky. He was a quadriplegic. He was still not understanding everything that was going on. About a, a couple of weeks later, when he finally had a track in and he could, couldn't speak, but he could mouth things. So I got pretty good at lip reading. And again, here comes the whiteboard, at which I was still not getting any better. The next, in the, the first sentence he came out with was, how hard do you want me to try? It was gutting. How do you tell someone you love that they've got to just get there and be gutsy beyond belief? When we first got together 35 odd years ago, I remember we met in New York and I remember being so in love with this individual, those early love days, we all know what it's like. And I remember I said to him, when we were trying to figure out what we we're going to do with the rest of our lives, I said, Jay, I'd follow you to Antarctica. <coughs> and all I said to him that day when he said, how hard do you want me to try? And I said, darling, I said I'd follow you to Antarctica. It looks like we're here. Every day is going to be a new day, but all I want for John and seeing these videos and the exceptional work of the professor, I only want one hand, one arm, that makes his life a little bit more bearable. If it's not an official miracle, it will be. Move over, Mother Teresa. Mm. Thanks, thanks, Kerry Ann. Um, I also wanted to ask you, um, what are some of the unexpected impacts that it's had on your life, not just yours and John's, but on your, uh, your local group of friends and your community as well? Well, it, you know, it's just all-encompassing. Nobody really knows what to say. Nobody really knows what to ask. Um, uh, everybody wants to communicate, but finds it difficult. Uh, and to be quite frank, uh, it, I'm just too bo busy most of the time to try and explain. Um, the texts and emails I've gotten, which I now look back in the last six months and go, oh, how rude, I didn't respond to more than half of them. Number one, I couldn't cope all the time, and number two, I didn't have time. Number three, I didn't know what to say. Half the time I'll pick up a magazine because I remember walking past the newsagent one day and there's our picture on the front, and, I'm, and it's gone, John's home, and I thought, bugger, I'd better hurry. <laughs> uh, so people have this misinformation. <laughs> so it's, um, it's completely encompassing. It's 24-7, and it's not like a lot of other diseases, um, where a lot of other diseases, shocking, and everything deserves money for research. That said, I had breast cancer. I was lucky, I got diagnosed early. <coughs> I had treatment, had surgery, uh, radiotherapy. I got through it, horrible time. Now I'm better. Except John's injury is forever. The same as everybody else with his injury. We don't want it to be forever. Mm. And Duncan, um, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, about your experience and the impact that had on your life? Mm. Well, yes, a uh, long time ago now, 1984. Um, I, like so many uh, people who are injured, I was a young man. It does seem to be, uh, to a certain extent, a disease of testosterone, although we have seen that it can ha actually happen to anybody. Um, I was actually being quite sensible when, uh, when the accident happened, for a change. Um, uh, driving home one night, in the middle of the night, uh, in New Guinea, um, in the, the Skyline Highway there, a uh, very quiet road. We saw one other vehicle, but it happened to be uh, driven by a drunk driver who um, clipped the car just enough. It was an open top Jeep, just enough to tip it over. I say it was a very gentle accident. I mean, the windscreen popped out of the vehicle but didn't actually shatter. 
Um, and I popped out of the vehicle and did. Um, so uh, lying on the, uh, the roadside there, everything went from uh, happily married uh, just three months into my marriage, um, uh, great career prospects and enjoying everything I was doing day by day, to uh, not being able to move. Um, uh, so it's been, uh, it, it, it's, I mean, life-changing is, it doesn't encompass it. Um, it's absolutely shattering, but it's shattering for the people around you as well. Um, there's a terrible thing of uh, misplaced guilt for my wife was with me in the car and she found it almost harder to cope with than I did. Um, when you're injured, you get on with it. The people around you don't know how to help and somehow feel guilty that they're still wandering around. And it puts a great strain on that relationship and puts a great strain on your family who want to help and your friends who <coughs> want to help. So it's, it's uh, not just the individual that's affected. Um, thank you, Duncan. Bryce, you showed a slide very briefly. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit. When it comes to the perception of what a, a spinal cord injury in particular means, people tend to think about loss of mobility. But it's a lot more than that, isn't it? Can you tell us a little bit about some of the, maybe the unexpected things? You, were, you mentioned things like blood pressure, temperature regulation. Um, what are some of the other effects that it can have that you'd want to be remedying? Actually, I think um, <clears throat> to put it, turn it on its head, the question on its head a little bit, it's just to say that um, Reggie's and I have spent a lot of time talking and talking about the experiences of his, the people he's worked with who've had spinal cord injury. <clears throat> and what's been observed by Reggie is that some of them recover bladder function or bowel function or sexual function of a young man. Obviously, that's a big issue. Or they get temperature regulation back or they have their sensory function back. And the temperature regulation, I mean, a lot of spinal cord patients will talk about how freezing it is. But what Reggie's been able to say is that um, by s just seeing that in these changes mean so, so, so very much for the patients who've been injured, it's almost more important <clears throat> than getting out of the wheelchair. And I don't mean to be telling people in a wheelchair what's important to them, but I'm just saying what I hear. And be able to get some bladder function control back, some bowel function control, some sexual function. You know, it's just extraordinary. I I've seen friends of mine with a cold <clears throat> at the moment, I'm able to cough, I'm able to put pressure onto my lungs and bring up, sort of be able to deal with it. But if you've got a spinal cord injury, it's particularly a, a higher injury, you can't cough. You can't get clear out your lungs. And it's a terrifying thing to watch as a friend and very terrifying for the person going through it. So spinal cord injury is not, I think, about only about the inability to move. It's about a whole set of things that go with it. <clears throat> on the positive and the other side of that too is to say that a lot of the advances that are being made as a result of people like Reggie, and Reggie in particular, that other people are following in various times of investigations, the implication is that we can also look at other diseases affected and uh, that may not involve spinal cord injury but that where stimulation may play a role. And I think because it has such a wide ranging effect. Mm. Look, I'm happy to take some questions uh, from the audience. I saw a couple of hands uh, down the back there. Maybe we'll take these two uh, now. Um, and then if you have any more questions, please do raise your hand. I'll make a note of where you are and we'll try to get to you all uh, through the night. So let's take a question from uh, over on the right there. There it is. Um, I, I notice there's a lot of um, people involved from uh, UCLA and other institutions. So um, how are you going to integrate or bring that sort of talent pool, I guess, into what you're doing here at UTS? Reggie, would you want to answer that or shall I? Wait. Go ahead. I mean, <clears throat> I think our goal is to create... I mean, in the broader sense, we're going to have an umbrella, I think, between the two, the two organisations. But <clears throat> our goal is to create a team here, almost replicating Reggie's team. Although the other day we were discussing the possibility that some of your team may actually want to come over and work with us here in Australia. So the idea, though, in the, short, in the current idea is that we would with the support of SCIA and SCA who will help fund it and maybe some of you here today, create a team here in Australia who Reggie will 
You know, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. That's what I said at the beginning. We don't want to reinvent any wheel. We don't have time to reinvent wheels. We're going to work with a world leader, and he's going to help teach us, teach the people at UTS. And we've got some great people at UTS, let me tell you, some fantastic quality people. And we're going to recruit more fantastic quality people. <clears throat> and we're going to have, and Reggie's going to work with us to help train those individuals to first, as I said earlier, replicate, <clears throat> sorry, replicate the technology that Reggie has developed in the United States to make sure that we can actually see the same results here in Australia with our trained team and then subsequently to take that technology from where it is and to work with the mind leaders in engineering and in science and physics, mathematics, etc. at UTS but also working with people internationally including in Reggie's team to take that technology to the next level. So the bottom line is UTS is committing, is committing to this project. <clears throat> they're committing some space, they're committing equipment, they're committing to support the project to some to the extent that the university can and that's a really strong uh, extent and then we're going to go reach out to the community to build our team and that team will take the work from where we are today to where we want to take it next. <clears throat> we had another question. Uh, g'day. Um, I'm an incomplete paraplegic. Um, I had a spinal infarction. Outside that I'm healthy and in good nick for my age, my GP tells me. How do I get involved in this? I would like to be a guinea pig. Seriously. Mm, good question. Is there, uh, I mean, where, I suppose a broader question is, at what point does this research move into clinical trials on a, on a broader scale? Uh, one of the questions I suppose everyone wants to know is when you see research like this, is how far and what are the steps that we're going to be taking? Reggie? Yeah, we've... Uh, uh, we, we have uh, started a startup company uh, to, to try to get these new devices to the market as quickly as possible. And uh, our, our estimation is uh, it will probably take about two years to get the transcutaneous, the non-invasive stimulation to the level that will be approved in some country. We don't know where yet. Uh, and for the epidural implant, that's going to take about, uh, we estimate about five years from where we are right now. And uh, the, so to get to the, uh, to get the transcutaneous device, uh, we've estimated that we need, uh, 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 to get to first base, really, we need uh, about 10 to 11 million. But to get to the epidural uh, technology, that's going to be probably hundreds of uh, millions of dollars that, because those are much more demanding in terms of uh, what's necessary to demonstrate safety. So we're looking at two years and five years as, you know, for those two devices. In the meantime, uh, we still will be trying to get more uh, see, get, learn as much as we can about each of these devices uh, as far as how far we can take a given patient with a given type of intervention, how many times a week. There's so many questions that need to be uh, uh, addressed uh, in the meantime. Uh, but that two and five years uh, totally depends on uh, uh, appropriate financing. I say with, if we have the money that we need, uh, then that's, that would be uh, a fairly safe estimate, I think. And it's how a, much, unique, um, oh, sorry, a unique time in human history when it's not about if, it's about when, and the when is about whether we have the funding and the support to make it happen. Yeah, so this is a point I wanted to bring up, is uh, you've both been speaking uh, in very confident terms about the state of the, the research and the state of the technology at the moment. What are the bigger challenges at the moment? Are the bigger challenges the scientific and the technical, or are they the, getting the funding required to, to scale up the research as it's required? Right now, I would say we have a, a bag full of ideas and things we know exactly what needs to be done uh, and how rapidly we can proceed on asking, uh, getting the answers to those questions that have been raised uh, is, is financial. Uh, it, we've never been in this situation before. In the decades I've been in this business, it, it's, it's been, okay, where's the, where's the idea, Where, what's gonna work? And now I think we have pretty good information uh, that tells us that 
even if we could take it no further than what I've shown you now, uh, it would, uh, I think, result in uh, significant impact on, on the patients. So uh, I'm, I never thought we would be in this situation. I thought that this, the, this evidence would be so obvious that it would, everybody would want to support it. I can't explain why that's not the case, but it hasn't been the case. I mean, in a way, it's, it's a better problem to have, to have the ideas and just need the funding, but it's still a problem to need that funding. So, Duncan, I wanted to ask you about uh, what Spinal Cure does. People here might not be uh, familiar with the organisation. And t tell us a little bit about the importance of uh, community as well, engaging with research uh, as a two-way street. Uh, Yes, Spinal Cure has been around 20 years now, um, started by my friend Joanna Knott, um, uh, Professor Perry Bartlett from the Queensland Brain Institute and uh, a lawyer over in WA who started a similar organisation in the uh, United Kingdom um, with the sole aim of finding a, a cure for spinal cord injury. Um, these days we're a, a very small organisation. We've had a um, great deal of success influencing government policy um, with uh, significant funds, up to $80 million, pulled from um, uh, red light cameras speeding tickets into uh, state government neurotrauma programs over the years. Um, we're a very small team um, dedicated to this. Uh, we are very, very proud of what we're managing to help achieve here um, with this uh, intervention. And I think the, the, the wider uh, involvement of um, other streams, not just the neuromodulation, but the stem cells, the uh, um, inflammatory response, the assisted exercise with the help from our friends at uh, Spinal Cord Injuries Australia. Um, any cure isn't going to be one intervention. It's going to be a combination of uh, um, therapies and getting a department together uh, uh, under Bryce here that has that collaboration, cross-collaboration between uh, many scientists in different spheres, I think is going to be quite, uh, uh, quite a change. It's going to be a, a first, certainly in this uh, hemisphere. Um, and we're, um, uh, we're pretty excited about the prospects for the future there. Uh, let me take another question. There's the microphone is down the back, I believe. I saw you first, so you first. Thank you very much. There we go, far away. Uh, hello. This, this is actually a question for for Duncan. Um, I um, just saw this um, little paper here about Project Edge, a C collaboration, UTS and Spinal Cure. Um, what are the timelines um, of this project and I mean, this is in line with the two, five years that um, Professor Egerton was talking about, or is it different? Any details? Yes, um, we, uh, we've, we've started off uh, between uh, SCIA and Spinal Cure, um, and uh, with uh, funding from UTS, uh, committing initially two five-year fellowships. Um, and the funding we are attempting to raise, which between the 10 and $15 million mark uh, is planned to be spent over the five-year time frame, and we hope that within that frame, um, you know, the, the, the two to five years that uh, Reggie's talking about there, that we will see some results and some uh, products that could get rolled out to the wider community. Um, probably initially through a rehab or an intensive exercise like uh, SEIA's Neuromoves. Um, that's the vision at the moment. But yes, the time frames coincide. Uh, if we get uh, more money, then we can do it faster. <laughs> um, we've been speaking mainly uh, in this conversation about spinal cord injury, but it's not just about spinal cord injury, is it? Um, Maybe, Reggie, you'd like to talk about uh, applications outside of that particular area, and <coughs> Bryce talking about, uh, you're talking about new neurodegenerative disorders as well. Uh, is this another application of understanding um, neuronal plasticity? Reggie? Well, I think you could <clears throat> probably guess from my presentation that I feel that 
Uh, there are multiple situations where it uh, could uh, prove to be beneficial clinically. And I think when you think about stroke, for example, uh, we're very anxious to get to uh, some studies that will give us better ev evidence as to whether it's gonna work for stroke uh, and maybe which stroke patients, what kind of stroke, how long should it be. One of the subjects that I showed, uh, I didn't show you the data, but we, we did that same experiment with one person that was two weeks post-stroke and the other one that, one that I showed is seven months and there were actually similar results. So we're pretty uh, encouraging. You think of our populations are getting older, there's gonna be more strokes. And one of the, uh, uh, talking about financing, one of the things that we've always heard from the beginning uh, in trying to develop this technology is there's just not enough spinal cord injured subjects to make it economically feasible. Uh, so, but when you start to talk about stroke, they start to get on the edge of their seat and become interested. So, uh, it's, I, I can't, from my heart, I can't jump to stroke and leave spinal cord injury. I've been there too long, but I, I really want to, uh, that, that needs to be done. And I, I think for if we can uh, cerebral palsy and, and being able to impact children uh, could be huge. Uh, the bladder, uh, bladder dysfunction occurs in a lot of traumas and it, it, could, uh, it could be become a standard type of intervention that would uh, maybe uh, replace uh, catheterizing someone for a temporary uh, condition. And the same with respiration, the respiratory issues. So you can imagine if you could uh, uh, free a person of being on a respirator for a period of time because it's very hard to get off of the respirator. So uh, that's why we're, we're just in the beginning of, of understanding what the potential might be. Mm, and Bryce, what other conditions are you going to be looking at? So I mean, just to, <clears throat> I just want to explain why Reggie thinks that, why would it work in stroke? And, it's because he likes to turn the world upside down. You know how you've seen these maps of the world where you have a straighter at the top of the map? Um, the way Reggie thinks of the world is that the spinal cord is at the top and the brain is kind of this thing that gets in the way. And so what he thinks happens in stroke, we've had lots of conversations, is that what's probably happening in stroke, because a spinal, he says when he looks at a, spinal, uh, a stroke patient, he thinks to himself, well, a spinal cord, an animal that's not able to talk to the brain can walk better than a person who's had stroke. So what he thinks is probably happening is that the brain is actually interfering with the spinal cord. And this is why he believes that he can apply neural stimulation to the spinal cord and potentially um, be able to bring about some recovery. And he was very modest. He's got a little bit of data already to, to suggest that his idea isn't completely wrong, but it's a long journey ahead and UTS would like to jump in on that with you as well. Um, so th so what, what is exciting in science though is that ideas, there's all this cross fertilization of unexpected ideas, the sorts of sort of things we speak about with Reggie, when I start telling him my actual expertise, I'm, I've got, a, I'm got a, as the head of a centre, uh, I've got a responsibility to make sure that we put great leaders into different places and make sure we get great outcomes in everything we do. I'm going to be focusing on absolutely fantastic people, supporting them and making sure that we get everything behind them to be successful and relying very much on that from across the faculty as well. And that's going to be critical. But in my own research, I'm interested in learning and memory, and I'm interested in how learning memory goes wrong in neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. And in my own work, I've, like, I mean, I've, I've got a different way of thinking about what's going on in Alzheimer's. I've developed a very, very different theory about it. I think a lot of the way that we're going in that disease is potentially not going to get the kind of outcomes we need. We've seen that. There's been billions of dollars spent, many, many years of work, and we haven't got the outcomes of those diseases yet. And I think it's because we're looking at the problem incorrectly and we need to do the same thing. We need to turn the story on its head and think differently. And I think we need to think about learning and memory and how it goes wrong. I won't elaborate on that, but I am saying the centre has a broader vision. It's to, but ultimately it's about plasticity and it's ultimately about in each thing that we work on, getting great people from around the world, engaging together with the community to bring about an outcome by being focused on the outcome. That's where we're going to be going and we're going to drive teams together towards outcomes. Any other questions? There's one, uh, there's a couple down here and there's one down the back. We'll start with you, sir. Um, yeah. Um, thank you all for this forum. 
Uh, I've got a technical question to uh, Bryce and Reggie. I, I might say first, Bryce, I think your earlier metaphor uh, upgrading to a Maserati might be a little inappropriate. My experience, they're highly overpriced, typically moody pieces of Italian engineering that break down all the time. So maybe a nice Lexus or Porsche might be a better metaphor. Okay. But anyhow, I just wanted to uh, ask you, uh, probably to Professor Edgerton, uh, the stimulation in the transcutaneous and epidural uh, procedures, uh, is that only active when the uh, electric stimulation is present? Is there any residual benefits that have been seen? And secondly, obviously because you need that voluntary uh, contribution from the patient to get any real results, are you using any advanced visualisation techniques to facilitate that kind of process to connect the head to the uh, precipitation of the uh, outer limbs and other body to get that connection going? Technical question, but be my guess. Um, well, you uh, hit on a lot of uh, very good topics. Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> uh, the autonomic function tends to uh, uh, be recovered uh, independent of the presence of the stimulation. Uh, it, it, uh, so the bladder function uh, and uh, bowel function, temperature, uh, those things tend to occur with just repeated stimulation over a period of days. With the voluntary uh, uh, activation uh, with the upper limb, for example, we can stimulate when they're performing the task, but also test them after we stop the stimulation, and it lasts for some time after you stop the stimulation in an acute uh, session, say in one session. Uh, but I also alluded to the fact that uh, I think earlier that uh, with time, say with the, with the lower limb epidural stimulation, the four subjects, uh, uh, two of them uh, can actually perform some voluntary movement without any, uh, without any stimulation, but they can do better with some stimulation. And then I showed you the data that's, uh, uh, that's suggesting that we might be able to do better than that with the transcutaneous stimulation in the end, uh, as, as there was reorganization of the brain and the spinal cord, uh, they were able to move as well uh, with voluntary and stimulation was just as good as, or with voluntary alone was just as good as voluntary plus stimulation. So that's telling us that as we engage these circuits, uh, that they're starting to relearn on their own and become more independent of the stimulation. Again, how far uh, this is going to go, whether the person could eventually become completely independent uh, is a question that we, uh, we don't know. But those are uh, important questions and different systems are responding differently. Look, I want to ask a, a scientific question as well. N neuroplasticity is now being talked about a great deal. Right. Um, it's, it seems to have transformed the way we think about not just this aspect, but many other aspects of the way the brain and the nervous system works. Why was there such resistance, do you think? Why was, why was there why such, such resistance, resistance in the scientific community uh, to come around to this idea? Why was there such a dogged view that the brain was not as plastic as we believe it to be today? I don't understand it. Uh, well, some of the classic anatomist in the past, this is what they said. Remy Cajal. A hundred yeah. years ago, this was, this was been taught that there's no plasticity. When, when the Society for Neuroscience started in the US in the uh, early 1970 or 69, there was a, a clear view that there was no plasticity in the nervous system. And there really was really no evidence that that was the case. So why, how that opinion got stuck in everybody's mind so solidly is a lack of plasticity in their thinking. Perhaps. It's a lack of pla It's like the, the brain had been cemented in somehow. <laughs> it's it's yeah. just been a number of areas in science that are just mm -hmm. like that, and yeah. neuroscience in particular has been mm -hmm. held down by these ideas that get pushed on us and that. It's very hard to break through. You still see, I mean, 
Reggie is, is an overnight success in 50 years. But for, for the first 40 years of that, I mean, he wasn't always, you know, there were times when people were quite sceptical about what he was doing. And there's reasons for scientists to be sceptical. I mean, you can always look at the examples like Reggie, but we do see false hope. Well, I don't believe in false hope. Hope is hope. Hope is what humanity is. But promises, places in Asia who offer stem cells. I mean, these things are scary, and science is able to dissect out using data, what is true and what is not true. And it's very important in scientific discourse to go through the process of trying to prove something against a field of scepticism. And I think that's, we wouldn't be where we are with science if it wasn't for that process. But sometimes it does get, um, it does seem to be a little bit out of uh, perspective. And even the ideas of regeneration of the brain, as I said, when I came to Australia, I was starting to work on regenerative mechanisms in the brain, and I'm still working on those. And it, it was just now people have looked back and there was people saying it in the late 60s that this is occurring, the brain is regenerating. Totally ignored. Totally ignored. And it wasn't until the 2002 point when people started to think they had enough evidence, some beautiful, elegant experiments said, OK, this is real. And in fact, I remember reading a paper in the journal called Cell, which is the number one journal in the world in this area. And it said, you know, this is so extraordinary that what's going to come next is going to blow your mind. So. At some point, even the journal Cell was saying, OK, we've got to believe this stuff now. But it was a long battle from the 60s to 2002 to prove this idea. I would say dogma. I, I've come to believe that dogma is quite scary. In fact, what, especially when I'm lecturing to graduate students and young scientists, I'll tell them before my lecture, don't believe anything I right. tell you. And they... <laughs> why, why are you telling me Including that? Including that but stuff? <laughs> I think it's you, actually even written, sorry. So I was going to say, do you think, look, I'm a newbie in all this, the absolute dogged thinking that has had to be changed and it took from the 60s to 2002 or something to do that, I think basically it's because you're all too smart. Mm -hmm. actually, so no, bright, think... so intelligent. There's IQ and EQ. IQ gets you hired, EQ, you know, takes you a long way. And one of the issues I've found, you know, okay, interviews I've done over 30 odd years, there are people, it, it's not the brightest that actually get across the line. The real successes are the ones that just go little by little, but the ones that aren't so smart. Because with a lot of really seriously intelligent, fabulous scientists, they get stuck with tunnel vision. And I'm just observing this in the last few minutes, and I reckon the smart scientists just have tunnel vision because they're too bright. It needs dummies like me to come along and say, duh, why does that happen? And Change also, your thinking. And it's also about being taught what you're saying. And that's what I think what UTS wants, is doing and wants to do is teaching students to question. You've mm. got to ask questions. You mm. just I think, I think well, Einstein. science is taught as a series of, science is often taught as a series of facts. But most people are afraid to do that. Who wants to embarrass themselves? I'm used to embarrassing myself. Yeah, I've done it for too. 30 years yeah. because I ask the stupid questions. Mm. But I, I think, I think Einstein most talked other... about the, the role of imagination mm. in mm. science and imagination is seeing the things that aren't there and asking those questions and underscoring it with that rigorous method of, of science. But I did want to ask uh, you a question, Kerry Ann, and Duncan as well. When, your, uh, when the injury occurred to John and to you, what were you told in terms of we're now hearing about plasticity, we're now hearing that things are not set in stone and there is research um, showing that there might be possibilities mm. of changing uh, some of the, the function of our nervous system. What were you told? Were you told that it was a, a firm, concrete thing? Duncan? Uh, yeah, 30 years ago, that was it. That was the, that was the school of thinking. Um, uh, you were lying there. You will never walk again. That's what you've got. Get used to it. Um, and there was, there was very different treatments back then. We uh, spent um, eight weeks nailed to the end of the bed with um, uh, traction, uh, you know, uh, a sort of halo bolted into your head with weights hanging off the back to keep the, the neck stretched so the bones could re-knit. Um, by the time the eight weeks were up, every bit of muscle, every bit of thought, every bit of 
um, ability you might have had to move had gone. Uh, these days, they get people up as quickly as possible. They fuse the bones, get them out there, get them exercising, and that exercise, it's a use it or lose it situation. Um, it was very different back then. Uh, I don't believe anybody hurting themselves today should be told, this is it. Um, there are therapies coming through, like it, Reggie's work, which proves that you can improve and that there will be things in the next five years or so uh, which you can take, uh, make use of and improve your lot in life. And uh, I, I think it would be a, um, a very bad thing to say to anybody that that was it right now. You've got to give them the will to exercise, to mm. keep fit, to keep healthy, to keep hope. Well, tell me, what is your reaction? What was your reaction when you were first exposed to uh, the research being done by Reggie and Bryce? Yeah, I first read that paper in uh, 2011. It was actually one of the, uh, the reasons um, that I um, decided to join Spinal Cure, that that was the first evidence we'd seen that there was realistic possibility of improvement. Mm. And Kyrian, that, yeah. what was your reaction? Um, everything's sort of such a blur, to be quite frank, but I was very, very gently told that it was going to be a year before we would really know anything, and John's condition was so serious if he got through these first stages. Um, you know, the care was just wonderful, just sensational. But that said, there are certain people in the system. I walked in one night, the Wednesday night after the surgery, to uh, a doctor, French doctor, explaining to my husband that he was in control of his life and he had to think about his quality of life and they couldn't do anything for him that he didn't want. And I've walked in after I got a okay, I'm, I'm going, excuse me, what are you saying? Basically, he was saying, you know, you can starve yourself to death because, let's face it, you don't have very good prospects. I was so angry. I've said, mate, this conversation's over. When he walked out, luckily my husband doesn't remember this conversation, but when he walked out, John just had tears streaming down his face. And I, from then on, went and explained in no uncertain terms that nobody was ever going to speak to my husband in that hospital, whoever it be, without me being present. Full stop, no way, Jose, that is the way it's going to be. Um, there were several apologies, and we didn't see much of him for the next six weeks. Um, and I do remember one month after, wonderful guy over there, head guru, who'd met John for the first time that day, and but a charming guy. But he said, you quite frank, here he is. I, a month ago, I looked at this chart, looked at age, stage, injury. And I said to my people, what are we doing here? I've gone, huh? He said, well, you know, what's the point? And basically, they never thought he'd make it. But, you know, they told me he had, you know, stammer. He was really working hard and that he was a strong individual and that, you know, you're right on his tail. And, and I've just seen that today. He's pretty good. But his first words were, gee, first school of thought, what on earth are we doing? We're wasting our time. Next. That becomes pretty hard and cruel. Mm. But I don't ha harbour any ill feelings because it's, it's every day for those sort of people. It's just every single day. They can't afford to get emotionally attached to anything or anybody. To them, it's clinical, not to us. Mm. Look, we have time for one more question from the audience, please. Yeah, um, a few points on that sort of thing. Um, I was quite the opposite situation. I was told I would improve enough to walk. Now, obviously, that is not the case. I have improved a lot, but I cannot balance, therefore I cannot walk. Um, to face that reality, it's four years next week since this happened to me, 
to face that reality two, two and a half to three years into the situation, no, this is it on the current technology, and I throw that caveat in quite deliberately, um, why do these spinal specialists lie to you? I mean, basically, I was lied to. It was devastating. I should have gone through the grief, anger, and devastation of this is it at the time of it happening. And yet, I was lied to. I was also lied to by urologists. Um, you know, and again, that stretches the anger, the grief, the loss over a long period of time. So, mm. what? so I mean, this raises an important point. In terms of uh, the way practitioners feel, if they have an impression, like we were talking about the change from permanence to this idea of um, you know, plasticity and the ability to, for the nervous system to learn and to adapt, uh, is there still some resistance within uh, the, cl the clinicians who are treating individuals with these, uh, with these injuries uh, really? and a resistance to the new research that's coming up? It's a very, very, very complicated conversation. I, I, I do feel from the conversation. I think, look, there's no, I said it a couple of times today and I'll just reiterate my view of this and that is we mustn't be afraid of hope. You know, hope is humanity. Hope is why we have science. Hope, hope is real. Hope is... You can't have false hope. But you can have false promises. And promises that are given to people that indicate outcomes that may not be realistic under current understandings. And I think that those things need to be perhaps better dissected and articulated. But also, clinicians face enormous challenges. Um, I know some clinicians very, very well. And for me, in a scientific laboratory, I can think about different interpretations and different ways of dealing with a situation and different explanations and different experiments I can do. And, but if you're a clinician, someone comes into the ward and you know, they've just had whatever it is that they've got, the clinician has got to make a decision then and there about this person's life, and they have to be able to do it according to what is what we call best evidence or best practice. And they have no choice. They have got to act then and there on that basis. I think there is a question, and I think the way maybe it's being trained in, in medicine, that that gets taken a bit far when they're also trying to predict you know, the future for someone. I think that a doctor has no right in some respects to necessarily predict the future. They can say that, you know, and it may be some of the way that some of the younger doctors would need to be trained. But I think that no doctor that I know intentionally does anything other than act in the best of interest of the patients and the way they've been trained. But when you hear the stories like we've been hearing today, of course, for these chronic disorders where there are no treatments, yet there is real hope, how to can a doctor communicate that maybe is something that's reflecting the fact we are in a new period now and we may have to train our doctors a little bit differently in how we communicate and deal with these situations. Yeah, so on, on, that, on, the, sorry, on, that, on that point, we do have hope. We wouldn't be here listening to you guys if we didn't have hope that this technology has got a, a, a great deal of promise for us. Mm -hmm. So we well, wouldn't look, tonight be here. Is, tonight is all about yeah. uh, hope. I mean, that was the title. Uh, to come in. So we've, we're nearly out of time, but I wanted to ask one more question, which is maybe a little cheeky, but journalists will ask this kind of thing. When looking at research like this, we want to know kind of how soon. So could you paint a picture of where someone who's just suffered a spinal injury might be, say, in 15 years' time? Uh, what do you think might, if things go well, if you get the funding and you do the research and you get the successes that you expect to accept, to, 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 to get, where might they be? Reggie? Do you want to go first? Well, yeah. um, this kind of relates to something that I was going to make sure I made a comment uh, at the end. We've just been talking about the stimulation that we're doing. I would like to emphasize there is a lot of exciting stuff occurring from the engineering and the biology standpoint. We don't know when any of those are really going to mature. Uh, but I've always thought about the, the trying to solve the spinal cord injury uh, problems. I like to think of it as these are things that possibly can occur within five years. And this is what we might see in 10 years and so forth. And when we support the research, we should recognize that it, we, we have to go beyond just what's going to be right in front of us 
but we also have to think about the, the future and let these things develop. There's a lot of optimism and skepticism about stem cells. We don't know how that's going to work. Eventually, I suspect it is going to work, and I suspect it will be a, a, a combination of some type of neuromodulation like we're talking about tonight, along with that, and, and uh, that, that, that may make it even better. And then I, talk, I showed the example of with, with robotics. I, I think uh, that it's going to continue to, get, to improve, and uh, I think there are more really good scientists working in this area. And so we should keep our eyes open. And when I don't think what we're doing is the only answer. I, I think it's, it's one answer. And those that I would say, I don't think that's going to work. But I, I'm careful about saying that's not going to work because of my own experience. And so we don't know what's going to work. But uh, there are some good ideas out there. And uh, I think it's going to continue to uh, get much better. Bryce, would you venture a Yeah, so I, I, a I don't want to focus on 15 years. Because I, mm -hmm. I think that where we're at right now is so unprecedented. What this, this gentleman here has done after 40 years, mm -hmm. it is so unprecedented. He, he was talking to me t early tonight that some of the quadriplegics that he's been working on are getting some hand... This very thing you mm -hmm. were asking you'd like your husband to do. Maybe not to the extent you would like. But nevertheless, Reggie is already seeing that he's able to get some hand control back for quadriplegic where this was previously not possible. We are here and now got something that we have got to exploit right now. And that is UTS's wish, responsibility, desire. We want it happening fast because we think that we have to take what this gentleman has taken forward. We need to check it out. We need to reproduce it. And once we've reproduced it, we need to start making sure we get it out to as many people as possible and make it a maxima maximise its potential as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to do because five years ago, this was not a conversation. Today, we're talking about the fact we can bring back some recovery to some people. So I'm not interested in 15 years. I'm interested in right now. I want it to happen. Mm. So talking about hope, Carrie ann how does that uh, make you feel to hear that? I just, I just want to see this project accelerate, not decelerate. I want it to accelerate. I, as I said, talked before about the breast cancer research drugs treatment from 1981 for the 30 years of television I did. I saw those advances. Every decade it got better and better. I don't want this to take 30 years. It's got to accelerate. And I, I do think that we're in this era, era that, and you spearheading this and the genius work that, that you've done, that it's just got to get that momentum and just move on fast. Everybody's hanging out. And again, it does come back to funding. It, it's got to come back, show me the money. Yep. And I really hope it will accelerate. Thank you. Faster than anybody imagined. Mm. And, and, and it is snowballing. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, this field of science was considered a dead-end career because people didn't believe it, it was possible. These days, it's for the cool kids with a lot of very smart scientists coming into the field. And, uh, um, yep, they all need funding. And if we get the funding, we can make this happen. So thank you very much, all of you. We're out of time, I'm afraid. Uh, sorry, we can take uh, some more questions from the floor. Um, but I do want to say that uh, some of you have asked about your ability to participate and to engage with this research as well, and that's precisely what UTS um, is trying to do. So please, uh, I would encourage you to get in contact with, uh, with Bryce's centre um, and uh, engage with UTS, engage with uh, some of the other organisations like uh, Project, X, uh, Project Edge and um, Spinal Cure as well. But please join me in thanking um, our four panellists, uh, Professor Reggie Edgerton, Edgerton <laughs> Professor Bryce Vissel, Carrie ann Kennelly and Duncan Wallace. Uh, and thank you all very much uh, for attending tonight.